Good morning, Shelburne Street Church, and any who are joining us from around Victoria or outside of Victoria, BC. My name is Faye Hickman, and I welcome you to our online worship service. We hope you will be blessed and enriched by being with us today. This is a call to worship. Come worship with the Lord your God. From Psalm 66. Shout for joy to God, all the earth, sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sing praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Psalm 66, 1 through 4. God, we ask that you be with us today as we bring our praise to you. Enjoy the worship church. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God, let the people shout before His throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud to God, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea. Let all creation praise His name from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea. Let all creation praise his name. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout
worship Him in righteousness. We will worship Him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord of Good morning, everyone. This morning's reading will be taken from Psalm chapter 118, verses 1 and 2, and also verses 19 to 29. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with the branches, up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give, you, give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. This morning's second reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 1 to 11. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were coming out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thongs of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan River. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Well, good morning, church, um, and happy Palm Sunday to you. And uh, it's good to be here with you, and it's good to be diving into God's Word together. 
again today. Um, and as we're diving in, I'm kind of reminded of, of some work that we did last week in our online class on encountering the Bible. Um, last week, we were talking about the genre of narrative. And over 40% of the Bible is explicitly narrative. And it has all the same features of a master story, compelling plots, relatable characters, significant settings, and literary features that both guide and upset our reading experience. Now, one of the things about the Bible story is that as we read it and we reread it and we reread it, the story starts to read us as well. And that's the point. God's word is a living thing that, that moves beyond the pages of scripture. And, and it doesn't just want you to engage with it. The word wants you to find yourself in it, in him, right? That means that the narrative of scripture is going to bring us up short at times. It's going to surprise us. And it's going to ask us to do some really heavy lifting and ask some serious questions as we try to make sense of what's going on and what the implications are for us as people who are following God and who are trying to pattern our lives around his word and this great story. And today's a perfect example of how the story is going to bring us up short. So we have a psalm that looks forward to the Messiah's entry and coronation and the joy that is going to accompany it. And then we also have this account of it being fulfilled in Jesus, okay? And, and it starts it starts all the way back at the beginning where Mark says, this is the beginning of the good news, the gospel proclamation, basically the proclamation of the victory of Christ Jesus. And John the Baptist steps onto the scene and he is, you know, saying, all right, here it comes, prepare the way. And, and, and now we are into Jesus actually hitting the triumphal point that John and the entire gospel of Mark has been leading up to. And it's a pretty straightforward story on the surface. Let's read it. Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples ahead of him, saying to them, go into the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anybody asks you, why are you doing this? Tell them the Lord needs it, and he will send it back here shortly. And they went and they found a colt outside in the street tied to a doorway. And as they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? And the answer is Jesus had said. And the people let them go. And when they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. And many people spread their cloaks out on the road while others spread branches that they had cut in the fields. And those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Okay, so like I said, it's a pretty straightforward story on the surface. But when we start digging in a little bit, and when we start looking at what's actually happening here, there's a lot of tension and there's a lot of irony. And there is a significant question that we are going to have to answer about Jesus moving into our midst once again as we move through the events of Jesus last week on earth, his passion that leads us to Good Friday and Easter. Okay. Now, let's be honest for a moment. Maybe the last thing that any of us really want to do is to dwell on the suffering and the grief of Jesus right now. I mean, we've got so many other narratives of suffering and grief and loss that our collective ears and hearts have had to take in over this past year. Uh, we've dealt with victims of COVID-19. We've dealt with the grief of life changes that affected everyone um, that, that have had to alter our lives because of it. We've dealt with racial tragedies, George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, the victims in Atlanta that I talked about last week. I feel like the psalmist in Psalm 31 who says, my eyes, my eye wastes away from grief, my soul and my body also, my strength fails because of misery and my bones waste away. I know there are many among us and around us whose strength flags and whose bones are heavy. 
not because of a physical virus itself, but because of its effects on our connection and our routine, um, the effect on our hope that this time is going to pass. And, and even more, th this virus I talked about last week, okay, <laughs> the, that one, the infection of sin, it continues to replicate itself in both strange and unfortunately familiar ways. And, and we break down under the relentlessness of it all, okay? And yet, man, those words are so important to keep in front of us. And yet, Palm Sunday, the Passion, Good Friday, all of these things, they invite us to turn our feeble eyes and our hearts onto Jesus and to meditate on this one who is both the triumphant anointed king and the suffering servant, the one who Isaiah calls a man of suffering who is acquainted with infirmity and hardship. There's still hope to be found here, okay? That this entry into Jerusalem is still triumphant. Even now, even today, it's still triumphant for us. It starts with the fact that the psalmist proclaims at the beginning of Psalm 118 that nothing outlasts the steadfast, unflagging love of God. Your strength is gone. You can lean into his strength, for it will never be gone. You can't go on. Lift up your eyes. He is already crossing the distance to get to you and I to wherever it is that we are, right? Let the people of God say, whatever their current circumstances may be, his love endures forever. And that's the anchor for the rest of this song. And frankly, that's the anchor for this whole sermon, right? But we see in Psalm 18 that, that it is a psalm of movement. It's a sojourn. It's heading toward this single destination of the altar of God. Out of the distress, that same distress that we feel so deeply at times, a cry for help is lifted up. And it's answered by God. Refuge is found. Danger is averted. Life is spared. Victory is discovered, not by the power of the psalmist, but by the faithfulness of God. Prayers for gates to be opened and ways to be made clear that we may enter into the presence of God and receive his righteousness. They are answered. Despair turns into thanksgiving as the psalmist and the people complete their journey from the depths of the wilderness of despair to the very center of God's presence, his temple altar. And altars are for sacrifice, aren't they? Yeah. Sacrifice is sitting at the end of the journey, isn't it? And that's what we need to keep in mind. See, the entire gospel of Mark moves along this path, like I talked about. From the wilderness proclamation of John and the Baptist in the first few verses that we read earlier, this way is being prepared for the Messiah to come in, to come into his kingdom, to come into his own, remove the obstacles, make the path straight. The king of glory is on his way. And we have to remember, like for Mark, Messiah is an inherently royal term. The whole gospel moves like a kingly procession toward this coronation. And the coronation of God's chosen is going to be at the temple. And so it's, I guess it's pretty easy for us to see how, given the direction of the story, the characters that are inside the story, and even the reader of the story, how we might experience Jesus' actions as a triumphal entry in, in the sense of it's bringing him one step closer to establishing his throne in the ancient city of the kings of Israel. All the signs Jesus has been doing point to that. The disciples already know it, and they already have these visions of greatness and glory alongside their master and rabbi, right? It's no wonder that by the time Jesus gets to Jerusalem for Passover, the public opinion has turned decidedly messianic as well. Jesus is not only welcomed as the righteous one from Psalm 118, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, but they also start adding an explicitly royal elaboration. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David, okay? The people even start to act out ceremonies that signal Jesus' royal identity. They cover the ground with their cloaks. And that echoes the entry of King Jehu in 2 Kings, with palm, and then with palm branches as well, echoing the more recent conquering of Jerusalem by Simon Maccabeus. Okay, so we all know where the story is going. The king is coming in to his own. Except there's one tragic bit of irony here. Okay is that Jesus is the only one 
who knows exactly where the story is going. It is going to shameful execution. He's known it, and honestly, we have known it as readers. For the first time that Jesus reveals his identity to the disciples, he says, this is the way it's going to be. And they don't understand it, but we do. And I just have to admit to you, though, no matter how many times I read this, there is a part of me that wants to hope that it's going to go a different way, that Jesus can avoid all of the pain and the shame of the cross. I know this is going to sound bad, but like, I wish that Jesus would be more like the king that I want him to be than the king that, that he is. And, and that's really the point of this, isn't it? Right? Jesus' mission per se isn't to die, but his mission is radical redemption and the removal of shame. And he is not going to stop even when it becomes too disruptive or too offensive for those who are wielding power, who are trying to tell everyone what Messiah ought to be even though they don't know the mind of God. Jesus ends up choosing death because toning down the transforming love of God to avoid death is not an option for the true Messiah. I heard one person put it this way, Jesus can only love at full speed, and that's inevitably going to put him on a crash course with the cross. This is not your normal power-wielding, arming-raising king. He comes on a young donkey, not a big war horse. He is deliberate in his fulfillment of scripture. Yes, Mark says you have to see him as a king, but the only way you can see him as the king is to be able to completely reimagine the concept of king in accordance with the mission of the Messiah. The story is not going to go the way that you think it is or even the way that you want it to. Instead of enthroning himself in the temple, Jesus does something very different. Okay, he goes in and inspects. He perceives he internally weighs, and then he leaves. And this is a very abrupt and kind of anticlimactic thing. And, and it puts the brakes on the whole gospel, frankly. I mean, you can imagine like the people and the disciples, how they had to feel. They probably felt it as keenly as you feel it as a reader. Wait, we came all this way. We've come through all this fanfare and all the shouting and the palm branches and the cloaks and everything. And all you do is go look around in the temple and then say, well, it's kind of late. Let's head back out and we'll come back tomorrow. That, that doesn't make any sense to them or to us. It's only when we watch Mark intentionally intersperse the withering of the fig tree in two parts around Jesus' action at the temple that Jesus' actions start to make sense. The king comes into his temple, his throne room, looking for the fruit of righteousness in it the proper seat of authority for his kingship that's marked by sacrificial love and redemption. And even though he searches high and low, the same way he does among the leaves of this miraculous fig tree that's all leaved up out of season and looks like it should be full of fruit. When he looks, there's nothing to be found anywhere. Now the fig tree gets cast aside, okay? It's withered outside, matching its fruitless inside, okay? But the temple... Eventually, it's going to be cast aside as well, but first, something else has to be done. A cleansing is in order, and Jesus is going to remove the obstacles of greed and pride and hierarchy and anything else that keep people from embracing the sacrifices that draw them near to God, and it foreshadows the way he's going to remove all barriers between humanity and God on the cross by becoming the sacrifice that draws us near to God. The king has come into his own, says the gospel, but this king's different, and this story's different. And if you refuse the king as he is, all the hosannas and blessings are for nothing. And this, I think, is why we have to come back not only to the Easter story frequently, but why we come back to this ironically triumphant entry again and again, year after year. We need to be reminded again and again that we are very good at missing the point of who this King Jesus is and what he's come to do. He isn't coming to give us what we want, a world accord, that's been ordered up according to our image and according to our understandings and our expectations of righteousness under a divine exercise of a human power through force. No, he's coming to give us what we need, a restored relationship that streams out and reorders the world around us in Christ's image 
through a human exercise of divine power in the sacrifice of the cross. And that way, the way that he goes and the way that he invites us to go, it's harder. And because it's harder, and we would rather have an earthly king than a suffering servant as our model, this is what we have to wrestle with, honestly. We have to wrestle with the fact that even now we have this terrible capacity for both being able to come to Jesus and to be able to kill Jesus. We still sit with that same choice all the time because if we let the king come into his temple, he's going to start cleaning house. And this initially seems like it is really bad news, okay? I mean, admittedly, growing up when I was reading this story and even through the years when I've read this story, I am tempted to either identify with the money changers who have corrupted the temple or, or the priests who are kind of behind the corruption of the money changers or even just the bystanders who are just kind of confused and uninvolved and just kind of try to stay back and watch the whole thing. Either Jesus is coming in to bring the smack down on my sinfulness and my inadequacy or I'm just breathing a sigh of relief that he chose someone more obviously sinful and inadequate than me this time. That's not a very good takeaway. But I think that's still kind of where we tend to go when we look at Jesus cleansing the temple. But what if I'm supposed to see myself somewhere else? What if I'm supposed to see myself as the temple? Last week, we talked about the radical work that God wants to do in our hearts, how he wants to write his law of love inside of us. So that our righteousness is not one of trying to measure up out of obligation, not something compromised by our systemic sin anymore, but it's a righteousness that is welling up out of his righteousness that he has planted within our hearts, okay? Now, if my heart and my very self are now to be the temple of the living God, I definitely want and need him to clean house, but I'm also going to resist that because his idea of cleansing is much like his own refinement. You remember the claim that he makes, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it again in three days, death, burial, and resurrection. And what's good for the king is good for the servant. What's good for him is good for me. His idea of cleansing is death, burial, and resurrection in his image. That is the king's remodeling plan for my life, for your life, for our lives, for the church, for humanity. And Psalm 118 is, is very good at telegraphing my response, okay? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. I want to be the architect of my life, my temple. I want to build my temple around the worship of me, frankly. And I wish that Jesus would be a different kind of king. You know, the kind of king that just wants me to be good and feel good, and then will basically leave me alone. Not a king that's going to reconstruct me from the ground up, even though that's what I need. That is exactly what we all need because it's that systemic sin that's telling me that I'm a better architect than God that wants to deny this verse of the song. The Lord has done this thing and I marvel in its goodness, right? Sure, I want him to save me. I want to find refuge. I want to have victory over my adversaries and my enemies. I want to join him in this triumphal procession into the holy city, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Like, I want all that. But I don't want to head to the altar. And I sure don't want to be a sacrifice on that altar, even a living one. And so here we are, church, just like every Palm Sunday. We are observing the king drawing near, coming into his own. The great redemptive story of God is coming to its climax again, and the same question fixates us. Will we let the king come into his temple or not? Will we join him at the altar? Will we let him cleanse us and be enthroned in our hearts? Or will we seek his death for being the king that we need instead of the king that we wanted? He still lovingly leaves the choice in our hands. Lift your eyes and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, says the prophet Zechariah. Your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey.
Hello, beautiful church family. Um, so this will be my last communion video um, in New Zealand because very shortly I will be returning to Canada. Um, and while I'm very sad about leaving New Zealand and leaving the people I met here, uh, I'm very excited about reconnecting with family and friends and with my church family as well. Um, yeah, really looking forward to that. <sighs> but guys, Palm Sunday is here. Like. That's really, really cool. Really cool. Um, I've been thinking a bit about that, and I've been thinking about how um, traditionally, or in my life, I have sort of approached Palm Sunday with a great sadness. Um, because I know how the story's going to go. I know how Jesus is going to die a very, very horrible death on the cross. And yes, he is raised again. Like, that is exciting. But the grief and the, the pain that you... Um, start to feel for Jesus because you know what's coming it just kind of for me it always began on Palm Sunday and as I was like rereading my Bible and reviewing like some other text I realized like how wrong that is like yes we know how the story is going to end but it does end in victory and at this time on Palm Sunday, Jesus is entering his kingdom. He is entering his Jerusalem and he is being acknowledged for the king that he is. And I just think that is so cool. Um, and I realize I've been looking at it a totally the wrong way. Like Jesus is being recognized for his power. And because of that, we should celebrate because Jesus is God. Jesus is our king. And we need to get up with our with our palm leaves, with our cedar branches, and just start waving them and dancing and celebrating of who Christ is, because he is king, and he deserves all the praise and all the glory. Um, and I think that's just how I'm definitely going to approach Palm Sunday now, is with a lot of dancing and a lot of just admiration towards people recognizing and hundreds and thousands of people recognizing who Jesus is before his resurrection. Um, and on that note, I am going to pray the prayer for communion from the uh, Book of Common Prayer. And then we can take the elements together as a church. So, the table of bread is now to be made ready. It is the table of company with Jesus and all who love him. It is the table of sharing with the poor of the world with whom Jesus identified himself. It is the table of communion with the earth in which Christ became incarnate. So come to this table, you who have much faith and you who would like to have more, you who have been here often and you who have not been here for a long time, you who have tried to follow Jesus and you who have failed. Come. It is Christ who invites us to meet him here. Loving God, through your goodness, we have this bread and wine to offer, which has come forth from the earth and human hands have made. May we know your presence in the sharing so that we may know your touch and presence in all things. We celebrate the life that Jesus has shared among his humanity through the centuries and shares with us now. Made one in Christ and one with each other, we offer these gifts and with them ourselves in a single living act of praise. Amen. Bless you, church.
Hello Church, this is my blessing for you today. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace and give you peace. The Lord Make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Be gracious, the Lord be gracious, gracious unto you. Have a blessed week, church, and we hope to see you soon. I will worship, I will worship with all of my heart, with all of my heart. I will praise you, I will praise you with all of my strength, with all my strength. I I will trust you.